I'm not quite sure if this is gonna work, but I figured I would give it a try anyway. <laughs> What's going on, y'all? It's freaking dope to see you guys, man, and I truly hope that you are doing good and that your week is going good too, man, for mm, real. Now, one thing I forgot to apologize in my last video, if you hear a slight humming in these videos, it's because I have the fan on. It's like 40-some degrees with the humidity today. She's hot, bruh. I love heat, but I do not like humidity, man. Ugh, it's freaking brutal. I imagine you guys get some of it over there, too. It's nasty. But anyways, dude, to get to it, man, the reason why I kind of picked one of these is because, like I said in my last video, uh, my anxiety is, like, super high just because I got a house full of people right now. So I feel uncomfortable jumping around and getting excited. I'm just weird like that. But I want to do something, man, and I've always just watched these videos by myself. Um, just like off camera, I guess you could say. And I always kind of thought they were pretty interesting, man. And I just happened to see this one on the side there after finishing that M. Honcho video, which was freaking awesome, by the way. Hello. Um, <laughs> but I wanted to dive into one of these, man, and I figured, hey, this one's kind of new. Haven't seen it yet. Might as well check it out. So, a big shout out to you guys, man. Let is, let is get this going. Let us get this going. Come on now. Get it right, Jeff. Come that patient. Oh, hold on, bro. It's too far back. My charger said, can you go up to the toilets there and just check on that patient? And I went up, and the next minute he had me by the neck, and he was trying to strangle me, and it was fight or flight. Damn, here we go. The first one I've seen is probably the first one that everybody else, everybody else seen was the one of that uh, the sniper that had the longest kill, which I will say was held by a Canadian up until that point. <laughs> How and why did you decide to start a career in uh, mental health? I left school with no qualifications and I just took a part-time job uh, at a cash and carry store. I remember a chap coming up with his family uh, to look at a radio and I, I went up onto the ladder to get this radio down and uh, just as I came down, the chap collapsed and banged his head on the glass cabinet and unknown to me he'd had, had a heart attack um, wow. and he had died right out Whoa. and i thought throughout that for for quite a few months after um, i felt that i could have done something and it was my uh, manager who was a ex-retired mental health nurse who said to me Paul, it's, it's really playing you up, you know. Huh. Um, why don't you go down the route of nursing? And uh, it was a hospital called St. Lawrence's in Bodmin, Cornwall. And I applied for this job. I didn't tell my family because <coughs> they probably thought, oh my gosh, because I was a bit of a rebel in the family. Um, and I First of all, that is too crazy, man. Like, you don't hear stories like that of how somebody got into something. Like, he had a real life situation happened to him and oddly enough it inspired him to go do this usually it's like oh this is i got into this because i read an article or i got into this because this is what my family did that's crazy man oh my gosh because i was a bit of a rebel in the family um right. well, and i went accent, for the interview and awesome. a couple of days later i received this letter to say that i've been accepted as a nursing assistant as I went in on my first day, uh, I really grew up. It really made me think, oh my gosh, this is a different world altogether. And they put me on a ward that was extremely busy. Wow. Um, I like how he said that, man. I really grew up to realize that. That's kind of, I hate to say neat, but it is, man. Me, myself included. I took a long time to grow up, still growing up. Altogether. And they put me on a ward that was extremely busy. Um, it was an admission ward uh, where patients came in and they were assessed. Um, but eventually I worked on most wards in St. Lawrence's. What kind of illnesses were you dealing with at St. Lawrence? The kind of illnesses patients had were um, schizophrenia, uh, manic depressive, um, uh, <laughs> depression, OCD, anxiety. Mm. And of course, not forgetting, uh, back then, you know, some 40 years ago, Damn. you would have what they called back then 
uh, by the layperson as a, a village idiot who maybe mm. has gone out and smashed up a telephone kiosk and has, has become a bit of a problem in the community. They That's were actually sent to St. Lawrence's and they'd been there for a long time. You were very young when you started. How did it feel to be there surrounded by people with this quite severe mental health issues? It was quite harrowing, to be honest with you. I remember the first week my charge nurse said, can you go up to the toilets there and just check on this that patient? This was the first week. And I went up and the next minute he had me by the neck and we had white coats on um, and he was trying to strangle me and it was fight or flight, you know. I've, it really shook me up and I came out and I thought, well, one thing here, don't leave yourself, you know, don't become complacent. There mm. was a lot of violence. I mean, it didn't happen every day, truth. but you got to realize that, you know, on each ward with that, that, that volume of patients um, living under one roof, there would be tension. And of course the illnesses, and if somebody's paranoid or delusional, there, there are <clears throat> cases where, um, they think you're that you're after them you're going to attack them mm. so they would that brings me back i used to work when i was 19 i used to work in a special care home that looked after like mentally challenged adults <clears throat> and um there was a schizophrenic she was kind of having a break and that's what she thought like i was i didn't really know what to do i was only 19 it was the overnight shift i was by myself so i just kind of talked calmly to her but yeah, it was just strange. Just one second there. There we go. Um, they think you're... It's not strange and, like, weird. I mean strange and, like... Uh, I was, like, trying to tell her that things weren't there. And, like I said, I didn't really know how to handle it myself. So I was just kind of trying to be nice. And I couldn't imagine what he had to deal with. Just <clears throat> being in there all the time. It's... Uh, it is. It's going to be hard on his mental health. Why don't you shut up, McLovin, and let him talk? <laughs> there, there are cases where um, they think you're, that you're after them. You're going to attack them, so they would attack you first. And I remember talking to a patient who I had a good therapeutic relationship with, and uh, he, this, he just stared at me, and I thought, this is, something's going on here. And I said to him, are you okay? No, he said, uh, the, the voices are telling me to kill you. Oof. And it was so real to him, you know. You have to be a certain person to go into nursing. And those that aren't the certain people, they stand out. Mm. You know, and, I, and I've, I often had that as a ward manager recruiting the staff. You could just tell, the, the, you know, if somebody's empathetic and uh, they're a caring person. And there's a, there's a lot. That's the truth, man. There's a line that I heard. I can't remember who said it. But it's something of what we what we perceive as crazy is somebody else's reality. And that's just always kind of stuck with me. Whenever I see somebody who might be strung out on drugs or might be talking to somebody that's not even there. Well, in their head, that person is there, man. That's their reality. And I've always kind of wondered what it's like, man. Not that I would ever want to experience some of that myself, but... I don't know, it just opened up my eyes to a bit more, I found. Somebody's empathetic and uh, they're a caring person. And there's a, there's a line, you know, you've got to be, you've got to be strong and you've got to, you know, there's, there's boundaries with patients, etc. Um, but it's all a skill, all these are skills you learn over time, you know, and, and when you leave your shift, it's about leaving it all behind mm. and not taking it home. When did you make a decision to move to Broadmoor Hospital and why did you do that? Um, on my last ward at St. Lawrence's Hospital, uh, we had a lot of patients who had been at Broadmoor Hospital for some, I mean, back then, people were there for 30, 40 years, some were there for life. I thought, well, you can't go any higher than this. You know, I've worked in a few hospitals, but this is the hospital where patients can't be managed anywhere else. That's why they go to high secure hospitals. So basically Broadmoor is the place where a lot of criminals are held just because they otherwise pre present a threat to society and they need constant psychiatric <laughs> support. Is that right? Well, that is... I don't know if you guys could see on the screen there, I just tried to Google um, where Broadmoor Hospital was. 
It wouldn't tell me. <laughs> I don't know. It gave me the directions to my hospital. I don't need to go there. That's crazy. Correct, but um, not all of them. I mean... I'll tell you a story in my hospital. We just had uh, two people die in our emergency room. Sitting there waiting to get help. That's that's our hospital. That's that's great. You want to know why? I'll tell you why. Because it's a known thing up there that people in the hospitals are doing a lot of drugs. It's... <laughs> I'm not going to say what I was just about to say, but, uh, yeah, <laughs> it still happens, man, and it's sad that people are literally dying while they're waiting to get help, and they can't get help. It's crazy. We have, like, if you go in there with, like, a stomach problem, you're going to be in there. You're going to be in the emergency room for at least 24 hours before a doctor sees you, which is crazy. <laughs> what you get is you get, um, say somebody was sentenced to prison, for 10, 15 years, if they had a relapse, if they had any mental health issues and they were category A, etc., they would come to a high secure hospital, whether that's Broadmoor, Rampton, Ashworth, etc., and there they would be treated under that security with medication. Once they uh, became well, they would transfer back to prison. So it's hopping from one to the other. And some wow. people just continue to do that, you know, people who have been sentenced to life. That's kind of that's sad. What kind of criminals did you meet abroad? Oh, because I spelt it wrong. My bad. Well, I mean, you know, everybody knows who's, who's been at Broadmoor and who was there. But, um, you know, it's, it's the usual Ronnie Cray and Peter Sutcliffe. Oh. There's quite a few of them, which you, what you would call the infamous patients of uh, Broadmoor. Who is Peter Sutcliffe? I don't know much about Parents, him. you still stay up all night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're just going to skip this one right now. Say, if I give you an example, you know, we had one patient um, who was filming. He, he was in a lot of soaps, etc., with no names given. And he went hmm. off set. He became quite psychotic and he went off and... Um, he killed somebody uh, out on the street and he was sentenced to Bull War and I remember all the work we did with that chap and then there's some coverage that came up about five years later in one of the, the tabloids and um, you could just see how he deteriorated through that coverage. It was uh, just like, oh my gosh, you know, it's ha this is happening in a real effect on him, you know? Mm. There was quite a lot of examples of different um, criminals that were in psychiatric hospitals who created a lot of art, yeah. like Charlie Bronson or Ronnie yeah. Cray. I think that's the, 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 the only means at that time that they can get through to people, especially the staff, you know. I know a lot of psychologists have said art is the, uh, a huge theme when it comes to breaking down those barriers with a patient and huh. building that trust. Uh, that's why an art therapist is so oh. paramount on a unit, no and it's way. about somebody who's. Who, if I give you an example, I never would have is, known is that. quite depressed and they won't speak. You know, there's no communication going on. Um, they'll do it in their picture. They draw mm. something, and you can ask. You can go in depth with it. You know, what does this mean? What, what you put this here? What, what does that mean? Huh? Wow! I never would have thought of that. Yeah, because they would get them talking about, wow. Oh, man, see, I get, my brain gets blown by stuff like that. <clears throat> yeah, I never would have assumed. I've always heard, but I never put the two together that they would actually art. That is, I, I hate to say it, but it's almost beautiful in a way that you can't get this person to talk, but yet if they paint something, they'll, they'll talk about that, which inadvertently opens them up to start what that's that's gorgeous well, what does this mean what what you put this here what what does that mean what was the security like and what was the training like you're you're trained to use um what was called control and restraint back then uh, and that i believe came from <coughs> british airways at the very beginning because of pay, uh, passengers on flights who were becoming problematic and that that carried no over and the high secure hospitals huh. did that first so you are trained in that and so if somebody um attacked you you have those those uh different holds that you put on etc it's all it's all because it's safe 
you know, nobody gets hurt. Yeah, because you don't want to hurt And them. then I went on to do the shield training, so that's like what the prisons do. So if somebody did have a weapon, you would bring the shields out and um, restrain somebody with the shields. So that was hmm. very interesting. Because nobody likes violence, nobody wants violence, and somebody who's unwell, who doesn't realise that they're doing these things, mm. it's about making it safe, you, you know, because people many, many years ago have actually died through restraints. You've always uh. got to think a couple of steps ahead. You would never go in a room first, a patient's room. You would always have somebody with you. You would never leave yourself in a corner. Um, there's been times, and I know, there were two patients uh, one morning fighting in, in the a day room just the and the alarm bells went and everybody came in and I actually ended up on the patients holding the patient's head. This is all through your techniques that you were taught. And we went into the seclusion room and the seclusion room is used at the last resort. It's about bringing somebody down who's maybe gone from not to 10 in an arousal state mm. with aggression. And um, I remember holding the head and you always numbered everybody. You wouldn't call them the staff their names because you might have somebody with the same names. And I said, number one, leave the room. And they went out the room and I had the head and we turned them around. So I had the legs then. Number two, leave the room. Uh, and just as I was about to, you know, spring backwards to be caught by the staff, the door closed. Meet Remarkable. A complete. Ah, oh, these ad placements. <laughs> Cliffhanger. My bad, y'all. I keep saying I was going to get YouTube Premium and I keep forgetting. <laughs> I'll do it right now after this video. <laughs> and for whatever reason, nobody really forgot this there, that um, they thought I'd actually got out. I was out of the room. And they shut the door. And of course, there's the patient who jumped up off the bed. And to me, all I could think of is like hostage. You're yeah. now a hostage. Now, it, was, it seemed like forever, but it wasn't. It was maybe 10, 15 seconds, but that was enough to make me think, oh my gosh, you know. Mm. Yeah. How did you manage to get out of that one? Um, that one there, I actually, they pulled me out and they went back in and restrained the patient again and it all came out. And um, I think the staff just couldn't believe it. But it's still talked about today, you know. <laughs> it's one of those incidents in which I've seen a few and been involved in that always stayed with me, you know, because we had hostage training as well. And when you go deep into that, it's, um, it can be quite scary. Mm. What would be the most disturbing things you witnessed at Broadmoor Hospital, you think? Cutting, when somebody's cut their throat. That's, I mean, it doesn't happen. Wow, that is not what I, I wow. Yep, okay, I heard that does happen, but that's, wow. Yeah, man. How would you? Oh. Cutting when somebody's cut their throat. Whew. That's. I mean, it doesn't have to be Broadmoor. It can be a, any other hospital. But that's quite something. You know, Damn, you deal man. with it. But it's it's something. And obviously, when somebody's um, hung themselves, that's that's quite. Uh, especially when when you've got somebody so young. I've mm. come across a few that have been very young, and you just think. It makes you feel how lucky you are when you leave a shift, you know? When you've got somebody talking to you Ooh. and smiling. Dang, but that almost got me just talking about how young they are. It's, it's sad. You are when you leave a shift, you know? When you've got somebody talking to you and smiling and having a, a, a good joke, there's no, there's no indication that you're, they're going to go and do something. You know, usually mm -hmm. you can see triggers with somebody. You see triggers like their hands or the way they're looking. You know that patient inside out, really. Um, but when somebody doesn't do that and they're happy-go-lucky, and then five minutes later they're, they've, they've got a sheet around their neck, you think, well, there's no indication there. You wouldn't have put that person on observations because they didn't need them, you know. Yeah. Um, and what I learned through my career... Uh, with man, that's got to be hard. He's probably going to get to it, but I imagine there's a lot of guilt that he would feel. With hangings, etc., is that if they're going to do it, they'll do it. That's true. They really will. Yeah. Whether it's in the hospital or the grounds, they'll do it. But there's been lots of things throughout the career where you thought, oh my gosh, you know, um, you just wouldn't see that anywhere else, you know. And then you go, 
you'd finish your shift after a horrific shift. I mean, not every day is like that. And you go into the supermarket and you'd have a, a young lady going, afternoon, how was your day? You know, you think, oh, if only you knew. Whew, yeah, and you do man. have a bit of guilt. You think all the time, all the, all the input we've given that person and you, you feel like you've, you've let them down. Mm. Have it ever happened to anyone who you were kind of connected to? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, when you're, when you're especially at Broadmoor, when you're um, nursing there, you are given so many patients to look after. So that would be care plans, um, reviews. You, you're their name nurse, so you do build up that rapport. They call it unconditional positive regard, where you've got to put everything to one side. And I'll give you an example of that. What do you say, unconditional positive regard? No positive regard, where you've got to put everything to one side. And I'll give you an example of that. Hmm. If you know a patient's being transferred up to you and you <clears throat> have read the notes, that can have an effect before the person's walked on the unit. If you haven't read the notes and you build a rapport, and read them later, you seem to have that connection, more of a connection. It's all those different mm. things, like silence is the most powerful thing where some people would be so uncomfortable with it. That's a time for reflection, for the person to think about what you've said, or for me as well. Yeah. It's about um, all the different things you would ask and what you wouldn't That's ask. That's the truth, man. I've literally, well, not to compare, I guess, now I feel kind of dumb, but, yeah, man, and like, even in conversation, if I'm talking with somebody, if I stop talking for a minute, a lot of the time people think, like, I've gone off on something else in my head, where it's like, no, I'm just trying to take in what you said, think about it for a minute, and then I'm going to say something. Ask. I mean, you, you have to challenge some patients, but you wouldn't just go in on your own and challenge them, whatever it may be. You'd make sure that you had support with you. What do you say you liked most about your job? There was lots of funny things over time, you know, and you've got to have that sense of humour. And I have to say, the patients say the would humor. have a real laugh with you as well, you know? And that's what it was all about. Yeah, those humour is a real thing, man. Unless you've got, unless you, like, paramedics have it. Because you have to find a way to get through uh, stuff like this. But the chap who went running to the toilet and I said, are you all right? Oh, he said, I've got the, the runs. And he went off to the toilet. And I thought, you've been gone a while. So um, I went up to the toilet and I shouted the, the chap's name. We just called him Joe. I said, Joe, are you all right? He said, well, no. He said, the doctors have given me some salt and that's not working out very well. And I said, salt? What do you mean salt? Well, he said, I went to the ward round and instead of prescribing me medication, he said, just take some salt. So when I, I said, open the door a minute. So he opened the door, of course, there's feces all over the walls and that. And I said, what kind of salt did you take? He said, summer salt. And I thought that was really, you know, from somebody who's, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, I like that. Why did you make a decision to leave your career as psychiatric nurse? Um, through 35 years, I could retire. And uh, I had a good pension and a lump sum. And I thought it was time to go, but I didn't leave mental health. I left as a ward manager, I retired, got my 35 years and continued to work voluntary um, in lots of organizations. I've always been mm. linked uh, to, to, to mental health, always, you know. And by going around doing surveys around the United Kingdom, meeting so many different people and you know it's, it's fantastic yeah do you miss being at the, at the hospital sometimes i do when i go and visit units and um support staff uh it, t it takes you all back being on the, the units and patients will always come up to you not even knowing you and they'll, they'll say oh hello paul pleased to meet you and all that and <laughs> you can tell you're a nurse you know it's, it's quite amazing really but you never lose those skills you, you can build, you know, you can have that rapport right away. You can converse, and that's the biggest thing in nursing, is getting through to somebody. Yeah. But I always see it as a privilege to work somewhere like that, absolute privilege. You know, if you can just change somebody a little bit like that each day, 
that's good enough for me because you can't expect everything. You know, mm. people don't get well over overnight. But if you can make that little or bit of happiness baby steps, um, and and uh, make their day worthwhile, that that's good for me, and that's why I was in the job. Make their day worthwhile. Wow. Huh. That's something that, <clears throat> as he said that, literally in my head, I'm like, wow, I've literally taken. I took part of today for granted. You know what I mean? And he's there, literally just trying to make someone's day worth. Wow. Oh, I love people like this man. It's just. <clears throat> like. I don't mean this how it sounds. People have said to me, they're like, oh, well, you're a really nice person. Well, thank you. But not like this. There's different types of people, man. Like, I'm polite. Nice. <laughs> you know what I mean? This guy literally... Well, he said 35 years, man, just help, trying to help people out. And he, the part that stuck with me, he said, if somebody's going to kill themselves, they're going to do it. And... Yeah, I don't... How do I word this? Um... That's one of the weirdest things. He even said, like, there was no telltale signs. And they always say, when your friends are going to do something like that, be aware of these signs. But that's exactly how it happens. It's the happy-go-lucky guy. And then you turn around. Oh, yeah, man, I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> no, you don't. It's, oh, it's so crazy, man. That is, um, I was going to say insane. That's not the best, because it's not insane. Like, well, I guess the correlation... I guess is what blows my brain, man. I just find it um, interesting, I suppose, that even he, in a medical train atmosphere, still had a hard time uh, catching those signs, I guess, just because sometimes you're never going to know, man. It's crazy. And, and uh, make their day worthwhile, that, that's good for me, and that's why I was in the job. Hmm. That was awesome, man. Oh, what are they clipping up for the next one? Yeah, he said, you know, he said, um, you know, um, you're, you're with him well, and um, you've got this, this this diagnosis, schizoaffective disorder. I kind of thought my life was over as soon as I got that diagnosis. Oh, wow. It'd be interesting to hear. Again, try, coming from a point of that I don't know much about what somebody like that would go through, and to hear his story, man, uh, there's good people in the world, and then there's, like, good souls in the world, man. He is definitely one of them. Just even how he talked about it, you could still hear that he was passionate about the work. You know what I mean? And not once did I ever hear him say, like, oh, this person really pissed me off. He never used his emotions about the patients, you know what I mean? He might have used, like, a satire brought up some emotion talking about going through something afterwards but I don't know man when I think of a professional nurse he, he would be the epitome of what I would think dude so shout out to this guy man and um, yeah I don't, even the way he spoke I just found it was very interesting and very captivating I guess I, would, I could listen to that guy for hours he's got any more stories we need we, we need another 18 minutes <laughs> But, anyways, guys, I'm sorry that my energy isn't too high. Like I said, I'm a little anxious these days. Um, I still hope that everybody's doing good, man. If this worked, it's freaking awesome. I would love to do another one um, or anything like this. I'm always down to do it. Um, as for... There's a couple other guys. Uh, I'm not going to follow the trends of what everybody else is reacting to and stuff like that, but I just wanted to try something like this and see what it does. But... Anyways, man, I'm gonna tie this one up. As you can tell, I'm kind of rambling. <laughs> I freaking love you guys, man. I hope your week is going good. I hope you guys are doing good, man. And I shall catch you tomorrow. I shall be back. Freaking love y'all. <laughs>